Hi everybody and welcome back to Narrow Path Man with myself Luke McCann. I had a great conversation with Carla Lockhart, MP, uh, Member of Parliament in, in, UK, in the UK in Westminster, um, representing the Upper Ban region here in Northern Ireland. Um, and we, we touched on a number of different issues, particularly relating to live pro-life issues, which, which Carla's working on at the moment. So in, particularly, in particular, we looked at the challenges that there are here in Northern Ireland as our laws have dramatically changed um, over the course of the last year or two. Um, and we particularly looked at disability discrimination in the womb. What are the challenges there? Um, and then we looked at a call that Carla's done recently for pain relief for the government to require pain relief for babies from 12 weeks gestation onwards, because there's a lot of recent evidence to suggest that babies feel pain from at least 12 weeks. And at the moment, we can have abortions for any reason up to 24 weeks. And as we get into in the case of certain disabilities or even Down syndrome, you can have abortion right up to birth. So babies are feeling pain from 12 weeks, less than three months, yet six months later, you can still end their lives. So different sort of sensitive discussions, but important discussions that need to be had that we, we got into there. And then we just look, looked at a few different things in terms of the state of Christianity uh, in, in Northern Ireland in particular, and um, you know whether or not our political parties are, are ever going to be able to prioritize the most important issues in the right way without focusing too much on, on political issues and you know not necessarily putting the correct amount of manpower and resources into these incredibly important issues. And then lastly, we just touched on the role of media, whether they're a help or a hindrance in terms of actually benefiting political parties and different issues and movements or whether there's just too much bias there and different agendas and things like this. So hope you enjoy the show. If you get value from it, I would encourage you to share and of course, subscribe and make sure you click the, um, the bell button and hit all for all notifications so you don't miss any new videos. Anyway, yeah, enjoy the show. Alrighty, so today I have the pleasure of being joined by Carla Lockhart, MP, Member of Parliament for Upper Ban here in Northern Ireland, stroke North of Ireland, stroke Belfast and the surrounding fields, as I like to refer to it. Um, recently, Carla's been made uh, co-chair of the all-party parliamentary pro-life group in Westminster. So first of all, Carla, thanks very much for coming on to the chat. How's things? Good, thank you so much for having me. Um... A lot of big issues at the moment so always good to try and get the message out and try and rally support for the pro-life cause absolutely um and yeah thanks again for taking the time because i know things are incredibly um manic and busy at the moment in that regard so i suppose just in terms of the all party parliamentary pro-life group in in westminster which you've just been made co-chair of um, do you want to just tell us a bit about what your what your goals are with that group and just let us know a bit about the composition, like who is it that joins you in that group? Is it members of all different parties throughout the UK or what's it look like? So I was elected to Parliament in December 2019 and in my maiden speech um, I made reference, well my maiden speech really was focused on abortion and, and uh, obviously highlighting my pro-life stance uh, at that stage the regulations were being forced upon the people of Northern Ireland to accept abortion and I was speaking out against them uh, and at that stage I probably wasn't really aware of the undercurrent of support in terms of the pro-life movement in Westminster. It's not a very popular uh, issue to uh, attach yourself to yeah. uh, but in my mind it's the right one and, and I always believe that uh, we should be, be brave and bold when we, when we speak for the unborn. Uh, so after that speech, uh, I was approached by a number of other parliamentary uh, parliamentarians who said, look, would you like to uh, get involved in the all party pro-life group? And I was very keen to do that. Uh, so a lady who has headed that up for a long number of years is called Fiona Bruce um, and she has been uh, such a, a warrior uh, on this on this issue and, and speaks so graciously um, and has a lot of experience in how to articulate your point within the Mother of Parliament. So 
uh, it was Fiona that probably got me, me hooked into it and also uh, the DUP are a pro-life party and uh, my colleagues were also involved in this group and they were uh, they encouraged me as well to, to participate. So uh, that's how I got involved in it. Uh, lots of big issues, uh, you know, not only uh, the unborn, but also now there is a real drive and a push for euthanasia, end of life um, issues. So with lots of lots of things to, to be doing, my main aim is to try and restore life affirming laws uh, to the whole of the United Kingdom. Uh, we have millions of babies have been aborted uh, over the course of the last 50 odd years uh, since the, the introduction of the 1967 Act. And for me, that just is horrific. And we need to start to really get back to valuing life and that life begins uh, in the womb. Yeah. Um, in terms, looking specifically at Northern Ireland, um, it's obviously, there's been pretty major changes in, in the last year. We've always historically um, been a, a state which protects, that has a strong record in protecting the sanctity of human life um, and protecting the rights of the unborn child. Do you want to just, um, for listeners that might not know, do you want to just give us a high level overview of, of what our laws were prior to, to last year? And then the, the, where we are now in terms of the change that has been imposed on us by Westminster. And just give us an idea of what your thoughts are in terms of the manner in which that this has occurred. So prior to uh, 2019 and the interference of the Westminster government on this issue because Stormont had collapsed, um, we had very strong uh, pro-life, life-affirming laws. Uh, the only... Uh, criteria for uh, obtaining an abortion was if the mother's life was at risk um, and that in my mind is the way it should be we shouldn't have abortion laws that uh, permit uh, the murder of uh, an unborn child uh, for any reason unfortunately there were a cohort of MPs uh, in Westminster who forced the government to uh, interfere in Northern Ireland's laws because there was no functioning executive. And as a result, we have the most uh, draconian abortion laws in the whole of the United Kingdom and indeed all of Europe. So now our abortion laws as a result of Westminster's interference in what is a devolved issue, um, and by devolved issue, I mean the responsibility of our devolved administration, the Northern Ireland Executive. Um, so as a result, we now have abortion for any reason to 12 weeks. We have abortion on demand to 24 weeks, and we have abortion to birth on the basis of disability. Now, if you look at the 67 Act versus what we have now, um, we actually ha have more uh, invasive uh, abortion laws, and we have laws that really allow for abortion for any reason uh, to 24 weeks, which is in my mind wrong. Um, it should not be the case. And therefore my aim is to try and halt uh, the Westminster government interfering again in terms of the commissioning of these services. And obviously to try and ensure that our Northern Ireland Assembly uh, try to return to the laws that we previously had. So what we will be calling for and have called for is a repealing of section nine uh, of, the, of the act that introduced these abortion regulations. So that is our aim. Um, now, do I think uh, we will get there uh, quickly? Um, that's debatable. And, and I think it will take a long period of time to get back to where we were. Yeah. Um I suppose you touched on on two issues there um, that we can look at now in terms of the disability the discrimination that there is here and then also just the the call that you've made for for pain relief from from 12 weeks um gestation but firstly just I well, suppose first of all um today's the 23rd of March two days ago Sunday was world Down syndrome day um, I have here, I got something from live action I just saw on their Instagram said, did you know 
of the babies diagnosed with Down syndrome, 100% are aborted in Iceland, 98% are aborted in Denmark, 67% are aborted in the US. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, as the, as the law presently stands, there's substantial uh, discrimination in terms of if an unborn child has any form of disability, uh, including or, or if they have um, Down syndrome. So you've made a call to government to end the, this scenario where there is this discrimination if you have a disability or with Down syndrome. Um, can you tell us a bit more about, about this call to government and, and how that's going? Every day is a school day whenever you're dealing with, with pro-life issues. And, and this um, raised its head probably as a result of a very courageous young woman who is a Down syndrome uh, campaigner, um, Heidi Crowder. And I'm not sure if you know Heidi, but Heidi is, um, I called her on, on Sunday, I put up a little post for World Down Syndrome Day and I called her a bit of a pocket rocket. And that's just what she is. And she, she inspired me in the sense that she just, you know, she just feels as a result of the law that allows for termination to birth just because you have a disability such as um, Down syndrome, cleft palate, club foot, spina bifida, just because you have that disability, um, our law permits for uh, abortion to birth. Uh, and she said that makes her feel of less value. It makes her feel that her life is not worth living. Mm -hmm. um, and in my mind, you know, as a society, that is the wrong message to send out to anyone who lives with a disability. We should uh, value, and we do um, value people with disabilities, and we should not in any way discriminate uh, against them within the womb. And uh, Heidi is taking a case in the UK mainland uh, on this matter. Uh, however, working with assembly colleagues, and particularly Paul Given, who is an MLA in the Lagan Valley area. Uh, Paul has taken up the mantle to try and have our laws uh, changed to protect those with disabilities, particularly non-fatal disabilities, uh, but such is their value and worth in society. So uh, Paul Given is bringing forward that bill to the assembly. Obviously I'm a Westminster MP, so I don't get to vote directly on uh, the assembly issue. However, I'm supporting uh, Paul all the way in trying to have this bill um, brought to fruition so that we can uh, protect those with uh, disabilities. And, you know, it would be a massive step forward um, if we were able to, to win this argument and to ensure that this uh, bill becomes law, that they have equal protection uh, under the law as anyone uh, who, who doesn't have a disability. Morning. Fair play to Paul there. So thoughts and prayers with him and people need to get behind him. Um, so I'll do my best to share. Yeah, and uh, on that, just contact, contact your MLA. MLAs need lobbied on this issue. I know um, I know MLAs have received literally uh, thousands of emails. Uh, keep going. Keep at them. Uh, we had a good win last week mm -hmm. uh, whenever the bill passed the second stage. Um, so keep keep lobbying. Great stuff. So I suppose it's probably a good time to link in. You mentioned that if you have a disability or, or Down syndrome or something like that, you can, that abortion is permitted now up to birth. Um, and yet there is now recent evidence to indicate that um, babies can feel pain from in and around 12 weeks. So you've made a call to government to introduce some form of pain relief for, for babies in the womb from at least that stage of 12 weeks onwards. Um, do you want to just let us know, first of all, wh where did that information or evidence come from in terms of suggesting that that's, you know, how early um, during a pregnancy that a baby will be able to feel pain? And then also, where, where are we with that kind of um, proposal or call to government? Mm -hmm. So the, the all-party pro-life group um, prior to me uh, coming to Parliament uh, had commissioned a report uh, on fatal pain and it was very clearly evidenced within that report that babies can in fact feel pain uh, from 12 weeks at least 
Um, now, in my mind, that is just horrific. Um, you know, you take the scenario if you have someone who maybe can't speak or can't articulate, you know, their their feelings, and you were carrying out a medical procedure on them just because they can't speak and tell you that it's painful. Um, would you not administer pain relief? Uh, now, people will will challenge me and say, well, look, Carla, that surely you, um, uh, you know, saying some abortions are okay as long as there's pain relief. That's not the case. Uh, the pain relief issue is to humanize the fetus, mm -hmm. as it's now termed, to humanize the baby again and to make uh, women who uh, are going for uh, an abortion realize that given that there has to be a medical intervention to uh, you know dull the pain that is going to be inflicted on their baby yeah. um, it's to make them think that this is a human and therefore uh, what they are doing is 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 wrong um, so in my mind, it is all about humanizing and getting society back to the, the place where they recognize the value of life um, and that life is not just, uh, life's not to be taken uh, by another. Uh, so that's, that's in my mind, the main aim uh, around the fatal pain. And, you know, so many pro-abortion lobbyists use science and use, you know, their science their supposed scientific evidence in our pro-life movement we maybe haven't used the science uh, to our benefit so it's now starting to do that and you know I, I say this often you only have to look at you know dogs and donkeys and cats and whales and they have more protection if you are going uh to you know have a dog's babies aborted um or pups aborted um they they're afforded pain relief yeah uh, but yeah the baby in the womb isn't and uh, right to life is an organization that i would work very closely with they're the secretariat to the all-party group they have a video which is a very powerful video um and it shows a baby being aborted via uh, an injection and at 18 weeks you can see it wincing in the womb mm -hmm. and you know that in my mind is is something that shouldn't happen um and look i'm i'm a realist you know abortions aren't going to stop tomorrow uh therefore no baby no baby should be inflicted uh with pain uh so that's that's the aim of the the fetal pain yeah um, I, think, I think that's a great approach in terms of um it is such a like the clinics who who offer these services are such profit-seeking entities that they try and make it appear that the baby isn't human and that the whole thing is just a service. And that sort of dehumanization is what makes it such a, such a choice that doesn't invoke consciousness in the same way that it really should, if you know what I mean, in terms of like making that decision. And I think that just you know, highlighting these issues, like explaining how, you know, yes, babies feel at, at least from 12 weeks, they're feeling pain. I think it's a great approach because again, I understand that what you're saying in terms of different people may say that all oh, you're, you're kind of, um, it's almost like a, a bit of a cop out or something by saying that, oh, it's okay from this amount, but, but no, it's, it's, it's great because there's just less awareness than there needs to be. And I think it's good for more people to be informed and educated and be aware that, hang on, this is a baby. Not only is it a baby, but it feels pain. And we're able to end the life of that baby aggressively for a period much, much, much longer than from that instance where it starts feeling pain. So it is just about increasing that awareness, increasing the kind of knowledge and understanding that it is a child. And then I think a really important thing as well is once you kind of view it like that, then it, it becomes a complete cop-out for a man to say, oh, it's nothing to do with me. That issue's nothing to do with me because it doesn't matter if you're a man, it doesn't matter if you're a woman. It's important for people to recognize, hang on, this is a child. It's a child that feels pain. What am I doing about that? And if it's even as simple as having a discussion or you know, chatting with friends or family or just generally having a, it's too much of a cop-out. I think men need to kind of grow a set in a sense and be like, no, 
I need to stand up for, for, for life and protect the unborn, protect those entities which can protect themselves as best I can, even if it's uncomfortable, even if people, you know, mightn't, just, mightn't agree with you and might, you know, just take a different perspective altogether. But people need to appreciate that it's not done. It's done through love and done through kind of like this idea of protecting those which can't protect themselves and you need to do if, if you feel strongly about that you need to do that and you can't just sit in the sidelines type thing well again let me let me read that out um of babies diagnosed with down syndrome 100 of them are aborted in iceland 98 percent of them are aborted in denmark and we're heading in that direction um unless we actively do something about it so it's important that we do um i think too, i think too like the most basic human right is the right to life Mm -hmm. that is that is fundamentally people will say oh this is a human rights issue what about the rights of the unborn you know there are two people in 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 every scenario and look you know i don't i don't shirk away from the fact that the services that are available for women who find themselves in a crisis pregnancy or in a pregnancy where um you know there has been uh, issues the services are not there for them um and and therefore you know we need uh, we need as a people to rise up and actually support um support those who find themselves in this scenario and and it's the same for government you know government will throw millions of pounds at abortion but yet won't uh, put in place services to actually help people choose life so you know there is a challenge there for us and there's a challenge um, I always say for the church as well um, to rise up. Unfortunately, the church has become the last place where people who find themselves in this scenario um, will go to. But yet, it should be the first, yeah. um, and, and therefore there is a role for us all uh, to really uh, seek our own hearts and say, "How can I help someone who finds themselves in this in this situation and not be judgmental?" Yeah. I was going to ask this later, but I suppose I'll ask it now then. Um, like, what are your thoughts in general in terms of the state of Christianity in, in Northern Ireland in terms of, well, one, in terms of defending the kind of Christian morals, principles and values, whether you're Catholic, Protestant or any other denomination. Um, and then also, yes, in terms of not being judgmental, but being kind of loving in specifically that example you just kind of illustrated, you know, in terms of being there for people um, in, in all sorts of difficulties and all sorts of challenges. Yeah. Um, like there's no, there's no question that the church still has a place in society. It still has a huge influence in society and influence for good. Um, and therefore we must in our lawmaking uh, always uh, make provision to permit that uh, church religious uh, element uh, and protection. Unfortunately, there are those who, who would have you think that the church has no place. And there are those who would th make you think that, you know, oh, those religious people, they're just lunatics. Um, uh, unfortunately, I don't believe that's the majority. Um, uh, thankfully it's not the majority and, and I do still think that there is a real undercurrent uh, of people who recognize the value that the church has and the way in which the church can influence for good um, but as I say there's a challenge for us all um, that we need to move to practical Christianity yep. um, often we know maybe theologically we're where we're at and, 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 and why we believe what we believe, but yet how does that outwork on the ground for someone who's practically in need, uh, whether it be, um, you know, a woman who's, who finds herself in a crisis pregnancy or any other uh, social moral issues. Um, and it's about not being judgmental. It's about, you know, actually uh, showing real Christianity to that person who finds himself in that situation. Yeah. Um, one, one thing that I've the last few years um, moved towards is prioritization. Um, my, prior, my priorities have shifted in terms of these more 
the most important kind of Christian issues. I'm trying. I'm, I'm trying to move then towards like the most important elements of my life. If you know what I mean. I think that in Northern Ireland, what we do is obviously we've got this perennial battle at the moment where it's like it's orange v green and it, it's been that way since i was born and like 91 it was, it was you know and, that, and that's and i've lived through the good times type thing you know it was, it's been like that for a lot, lot longer than that um and whenever we're focusing all our efforts and attentions and the main political parties are, are focusing their efforts and attentions out of necessity in that battle we're losing time effort resources energy will manpower you know, that we could be using to fight these other battles and to focus more and more positive kind of ways about going, going about things. Do you, do you see there a, like being a way in which we can kind of come together more and people with kind of common Christian values across party lines can come together more? Or, um, or would you be more like pessimistic in terms of the short to medium term outlook in that regard? Or do you see a way we can head in a more positive mm -hmm. direction in that regard? I think if you take the issue of abortion, it unites parties and unites people. Um, I always give the example of um, just a couple of years ago, before I was elected as MP, before I even, you know, thought that that would ever be my calling in life. Um, I travelled to Westminster to highlight um, the the highlight the fact that you know not no all Northern Ireland women wanted abortion services provided uh, by Westminster since 2018 and I traveled across with literally people from all shades and uh, the one that that sticks out in my mind is Anne Brawley and Anne Brawley was um, a Sinn Féin I think she was an MLA at a time she was definitely a counsellor Francie Brawley was her husband um, he was um, a, an MLA for Sinn Féin as well. Anne and I unite on this issue um, because she values the unborn and she believes firmly that, um, you know, the unborn has the right to life. And, you know, in my mind that this transcends all political um, ideology. Um, and do I think do I think we'll ever get to the point where we'll unite on everything and you know uh, it'll all be peace and love and mm -hmm. uh, probably not but um, you know because we all do have very different political ideologies but in terms of these life issues we have to unite uh, or otherwise we won't win the battle um, and you know Paul's bill again is a testament to that. You know, if it was just the DUP party bringing forward the bill mm -hmm. uh, with the support of, you know, maybe the TV or some within the Ulster Unionist, which, you know, obviously are your Unionist party, the bill wouldn't stand, you know, the bill wouldn't become law. So, you know, therefore, there, there is a need to, to reach out and, and try and unite on these issues. And, and that has been done. And I trust that that will continue to be uh, the case. Yeah, well, hopefully, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a difficult one for, as, a, as a Catholic, first and foremost. Um, the kind of main parties that are associated, associated with Catholics here, they're, they're probably the parties that, that least defend these, these kind of Christian values, if you know what I mean. And that's a, that's a real difficulty for, for me as a Catholic. And, um, you know, I, I just really hope that, the more the nationalist parties to kind of get behind you um in, in these kind of uh well, they're, 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 they're just you know to encourage you there are some very strong mm. pro-life um uh, mlas particularly and mps um who who always take their stand uh, on these issues and and politically it hasn't been advantageous for them <laughs> um you know there are people who have been threatened with deselection there are people who have been you know, vilified within their own party internally, but yet they still continue to take this, take their stand. So take, for instance, the upper band constituency, um, you know, Dolores Kelly works very closely with me um, on life issues because she is pro-life. And it's those people that we need to hold up and, and ensure that, um, that there is support there. 
uh, because ultimately you know, this is a battlefield and we need all the support we can get. Um, one, one other issue I was going to touch on before I got sidetracked, um, sex selective abortion. Uh, what, are, what are the challenges there? So basically, again, it comes back to the fact that our laws uh, are, are so wide reaching and particularly around the 12 week issue. Um, so for any reason uh, to 12 weeks, that in, in our mind and, and certainly with the evidence across the world, uh, you know, sex selective abortions take place. So there are people who abort baby girls just because they don't want uh, a girl or that's not um, what uh, their desired uh, sex of the child is. So in our mind, our legislation is very open to abuse in that area. Um, we believe that the laws that have been shaped and framed very much still take it that you can't find out the sex of the baby until uh, 18 weeks, which is not the case for most couples. I like most couples will know much earlier than 18 weeks and you actually can tell from 10 weeks. So the number of people that go for private scans uh, at 10 weeks to find out the sex of their child is increasing year on year. Therefore, there is a window uh, of opportunity for people to uh, abort on the basis of, well, look, I have three girls, I don't want a fourth one. Um, so the, we believe there needs to be much stricter regulations around uh, sex selection. Now, the government is kicking back on that saying, oh, look, our statistics would not show that there is uh, sex selective abortions in, in, in UK. Um, but we believe that the laws are so wide that someone can say it's something else, but ultimately it leads to sex selection. Mm -hmm. So um, there is a job of work to try and, and peel that back and make sure that uh, sex selective abortions are not uh, permitted through yeah. our law. Um, so last thing really, um, in terms of the media, you, and in terms of building awareness and issues like this, you know, you're, if you're typically just getting all your information from the news or from listening to local radio shows and things like this, most people wouldn't be aware of these things. They wouldn't be aware that there's evidence to suggest that babies are feeling pain from 12 weeks. They wouldn't be aware of the discrimination that those which with disabilities, including Down syndrome, are facing. Um, so one, like in terms of our local media, there isn't much of an opportunity for you to have these discussions. You know, you might be invited onto a radio show to, to, to discuss one specific part of one issue, and it may be skewed in a way that kind of doesn't allow you to kind of have free reign and discussing and, and letting people know about all the issues and you have to do your best in that little pocket of of time to kind of get your main points across and um, so one thing that i'm looking to do with this channel anyway in a very modest way is is try and fill the gap in terms of just sort of true conversations there effectively and um, so what are your thoughts in terms of the state of our media and like because just the way I see it is there's there's a lot of bias, there's a lot of sort of agendas pushed and there's just less, especially now, you know, we don't have as many political talk shows and debates where people can freely discuss things. And you're also getting into the freedom of speech kind of element there. But um, yeah, what are your thoughts on the media in general's role in all this? Yeah, it's hugely frustrating, hugely frustrating for those of us who uh, hold dear to these values, but yet, um, you know, getting airtime, getting um, getting a presenter that actually is sympathetic or is willing to to listen to, you know, your point of view can be very very difficult. And um, and also, you know, I think I think traditionally there haven't been people maybe willing to put their head above the parapet on these issues because they just feel they're going to get it taken off. Um, by the media, but I think that's where potentially I have a role. Um, you know, the fact that I'm youngish, getting old, but um, uh, you know, the fact that I'm youngish and you know have a small child myself, um, 
makes it much more appealing for a, a media uh, presenter to come to me and ask me for my opinion. Um, so I think it's just getting people to take that, take that stand and put themselves out there, uh, safe in the knowledge that they have an army of people behind them uh, who are supporting them. Because that narrative now out there is that, you know, sometimes the minority's view is actually the majority. Um, but it's not the case. Like, I, I have been overwhelmed with the support that I have obtained, um, you know, as a result of the stand that I have taken uh, on this matter. So it is just starting to really encourage people to, to take a stand and actually getting young people engaged and that can sometimes be the hardest um you know yeah you, ju you just need to try and engage young people and, and and bring them onto the the stage and actually let the media see that there are people who are willing to to speak out and speak up do you think getting more involved with the schools and things like that might be a, an approach or is that something that's being tried at the moment i don't even know yeah, look, um, any medium at all, and even trying to get uh, people into the media who, who share some of the views that, that, that we hold, um, you know, so inspiring young people to, to take a career in, 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 in the media. Um, yeah, it, it, it is a challenge, and it's a challenge, you know, not just on, on the abortion front, on, on many fronts. Uh, trying to get uh, the, 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 the message out there. But look, there's lots of other uh, mediums. There's lots of other ways now of, of getting the message out there. Um, thankfully, you know, we do have free speech. We, you know, we are able to speak out and speak up. So therefore, you know, we've got to use any medium we can. And and maybe maybe this is just me, but I do think people are starting to starting to delve into things more and starting to question things and starting to do their own research and things. So therefore, you know, we've got to use the internet, you know, to, to back up our argument and, and get our message out there. The amount of people that have contacted me even through COVID who, you know, are questioning some of the government's uh, statistics, data, whatever, you know, and that's all information that, that they've gleaned from, from elsewhere. Um, so, I think people are starting to push back and question those things. Yeah, and long may that continue. Yeah, the, it's like any form of technology, it's great whenever it's used well, but no, the internet is great for it. And even if you look at your, like what do you have on Twitter? Something like eight or 9,000 followers, you know, it's, it's again, it's another great vehicle for being able to kind of share various yeah. messages, you know, quickly. Um, and I do think, like we're all inspired. We're all inspired by people, um, you know, and if I can just, inspire one other female to to speak out um that's you know that's been a that's been a win so you know that onus is on us all 100 to finish on a positive note uh, um after a pretty sensitive discussion uh, is there anything you're particularly excited about for the remainder of 2021 oh good question <laughs> um getting out and, and starting to get some normality back yeah. uh, to our lives seeing my, my family more uh, being able to go for a cup of coffee with them just the simple things in life and yeah, uh, yeah and uh, it would be remiss of me not to say 2021 is northern ireland's 100th anniversary um so we've, <laughs> lots, of things, <laughs> we've lots of things planned so looking I'd forward edit, to I'd edit this bit out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so looking forward to a good year. Good stuff, good stuff. All right, so we'll leave it there. Carla Lockhart, MP for Upper Band, thank you very much for taking the time today and best of luck with all that's going on over the next few weeks and months. All righty, great stuff. Thanks for watching if you've hung around this long. Thanks again to Carla for coming on the show. Really important um, conversation to have. So it was great that she was able to take time out of her incredibly busy schedule to come on and have this chat. What I'll do is I'll put um, a link to Carla's Twitter in the description below, just if you want to keep up to date with the different live issues that Carla's working on at the moment. And yeah, for more challenging information, for more authentic conversations like you received today, I'd encourage you to subscribe, click that bell button and then uh, keep watching. So yeah, many thanks. God bless. Keep the faith.